Hello everyone, my name is Aurélie Elouis and I'm very proud to be with you today. Um, first, I would like to thank the organizer of this event and especially Denise and André for their amazing job with Women in Quantum. And I think this is a wonderful initiative and a great opportunity for women to connect with outstanding people and I encourage you to join the community. And it's a big honor for me to share my quite unconventional journey from the Navy, the French Navy, actually, I guess you can hear my French accent, to quantum computing. And today, I would like to demonstrate that you don't need to come from a privileged family to have an interesting career. And you don't necessarily need to hold a PhD to work in deep tech. And you don't need to be a superwoman to be a mother and the CEO of a startup. And also, what I've noticed is that Everything we do today is a little piece somehow of what we will become tomorrow. And if, even if my career path seems a bit winding, actually you will see that my eclectic experience brought me where I am today. And today I'm the happy co-founder and CEO of Infinity Q, a startup in quantum computing based in Montreal, uh, in Canada. And at Infinity Q, we are developing a full quantum solution based on our own proprietary hardware. And actually, I am very fascinated by these new revolutionary computers. And soon they will allow us computations millions of times faster than today. At InfinityQ, we are focusing on developing software to solve problems in finance and in the pharmaceutical industry, especially with COVID for now. And at InfinityQ, we find simple solution to impossible problem. And actually, our technology uh, is a radical um, paradigm shift. We adopt a very different approach, but our approach is rigorously, mathematically fully proven. And it was inspired by the work of a Nobel Prize laureate. And this is very exciting because we already have four real qubits that are connected together. So it means that we have our first quantum computational capabilities that works at room temperature and that don't require any cryogenic or complex system. So that's, that's very, very exciting. And if it's not, even if it now it's a bit limited, um, our technology is highly scalable and easy to build. So it offers a lot of possibility to, to explore. As you can see, I love my job. I love the people I'm working with. I love the different challenges. And I'm not under the impression that I'm, that I'm working. And I think it's because entrepreneurship is really a passion. And passion, it started, everything started with passion. First, my passion for science. I studied mathematics and physics at school and I loved it. And I received a female technical and scientific vocational award, uh, which was very useful for my second passion, that is flying. Uh, when I was a child, I was passing by an airfield when I was going to the shopping mall with my parents. And actually, when I was um, 15, I asked my parents to stop. And I pushed the door of the air club and I started flying. And actually, I spent all the money that my parents, who didn't have a lot of money, saved during my whole life, like my birthday gift, my Christmas gift, and even my award that I received, all burnt in one summer. Um, but I got my pilot license before my driving license. So actually, I think my, par my parents were quite proud of me. And my passion is people. I love meeting new people. I believe in people some, sometimes too much. And I love discovering the world. I love new culture. And during my summer, my summertime, when I was a teenager, I worked in a circus camp for a year in Germany. And also I did the air cadet in Sweden and Canada. So technology, people, traveling, aircraft, Joining the, the French Navy and the naval aviation as a flight engineer was quite a logical choice. And the thing with Navy, uh, the scientific training is excellent. And also, uh, when I was 20, I had this unique opportunity 
to do a, a, a first tour around the world uh, for almost six months aboard a helicopter carrier. And honestly, it was quite a, of a, a, one of my best experience. And the Navy was an amazing school of life. It taught me a lot. The importance of value, honor, the sense of community, the valor, the discipline, the discipline with myself as well. And I learned leadership, teamwork, looking after my staff, also fast decision making, tricky situation management, and I had to manage quite a of some uh, tricky situation. Um, amongst another, for example, I had a runway excursion of an aircraft. I had someone who jumped out of a window. I had to deal with a case of alcoholism, a strike of civilian, the restructuration of my department, and even, even uh, had to deal with death. And also on the technical side, with my background uh, engineer, um, I had to deal with complex technology challenges. And the Rafale at that time was a jet aircraft still in development. And that was intellectually very stimulating. So as you can see, I was an officer and I had a lot of responsibility, but also I was a very young woman. But I loved it. You know, one of my best memories was when I was in charge of the department of the jet engine maintenance. I was autonomous. My team was wonderful. And we succeeded to deliver the engines to the aircraft carrier to support important uh, missions. And I think somehow that's where my passion for entrepreneurship came from. It was not always easy, though. Um, I remember when I was the CTO of the Rafale Squadron, I had more than 130 technicians under my order. But as you can see uh, on the picture, I was quite a young woman, and I was the first woman in his role. And uh, it was quite tough. And I remember my commanding officer telling me, oh, really, you will always be a woman who commands men. And, you know, he, he always highlighted the fact that I was good at HR and not really technique. Anyway, I had to deal with this uh, alpha male. And the good thing with fighter pilots, they are very demanding. So what you do well is quite normal. But when you don't do well, well, you don't do it twice. So excellence was a standard. Um, and also what Navy told me is, uh, managing the unexpected. Uh, I have this funny anecdote, actually. One morning when we were on a port of call at Djibouti, in Djibouti, um, I was on duty and I learned that I had to do a speech in front of the president of the Republic of Djibouti and present the Rafale. And of course, I didn't have any official guidelines and I had to improvise. And I still remember the admiral was smiling at me when I was promoting the Rafale to the president of Djibouti. So I guess it went okay. <laughs> um, so being deployed for a month, dealing with stressful situation uh, on, on, on sea, uh, even uh, at the Naval Air Station, it told me the resilience and hard working. And actually something interesting happened in my career. I got injured and I couldn't be deployed for six months and I had to stay at the Naval Air Station and I was devastated. I thought it was the end of my career. But the good thing actually, because the Rafale technology, um, uh, with the Rafale technology, the data analysis was something very important, especially to predict maintenance or prepare missions. I got hooked by the computer science and I did a degree in IT. So I discovered hardware, software, coding, algorithm, cybersecurity. And I became the CIO of the Naval Air Station and the officer in charge of cybersecurity and data management. And also on my personal side, it was a great opportunity uh, to stay ashore. And uh, I, that's when I had my, my two daughters. But I must confess at that time, IT wasn't the six years career path. But now I realize that it was a good change for me and it was decisive for my career. Anyway, after 16 years in the Navy, I took another dec decision that changed my life. I chose the opportunity to have a pedal conversion and start a new civilian life. 
And actually, it's because I wanted to discover the dark side of the falls, you know, the naughty industrial, because at that time, outsourcing was the new big trend. So I left my totally secure, very well-paid job in the Navy to move to Canada. Um, yeah, and to ensure a smooth transition to my civilian life, I chose to do an MBA at McGill University in Montreal. Um, well, I guess I kind of underestimated that going back to school when you are 35 years old with kids at home and doing the renovation of my apartment wasn't a smooth transition. Actually, it was not really smooth. And what also, uh, what was also funny is that I didn't know much about civilian life. And I remember my first career, my first meeting with career services in McGill. And they told me, Oh, Eddie, so what do you want to do? And I'm like, um, you know, based on my past, I want to be a CEO of VP in a company. And I remember the face when they were looking at me like, Oh my God. Anyway, even though it was tough, I did my internship at Pratt Whitney. It's a big US company that manufacture um, jet engines. And I got hired, I had a full-time job and quite well paid. Uh, it was during my first time of the, uh, my first year of the MBA. And it was great because I had something while some of my classmates were still struggling to find an internship. But something happened one evening that changed my life again. <laughs> Um, we had this entrepreneurship evening class in McGill, and the CEO of a Montreal incubator spoke the whole evening about being an entrepreneur, and he finished his speech with this question. Do you want half a million of dollars, a tech co-founder, and a great deep tech idea? Send me an email. I was like, wow, that's what I want to do. So I sent an email, I got an interview, and with my background, I guess, he saw some potential and I left my full-time job, very stable, my pension plan to become an entrepreneur. And I lot an entrepreneur startup in biosensing with a PhD co-founder, a very small lady. And it was great because I learned a lot about how to build a small company, how to develop a project, how to pitch an idea to, in, to investors, how to create a deck, to build strategy. And I had the theory with my MBA and the practice with my startup. And it was fantastic until I realized that while the deal they offered me wasn't that fantastic. And at the end of the day, the company wasn't really my own baby. So I tried to launch my own startup with an investor that I met in Paris and it was about drones. And we did a great market validation from potential customer, but at some point we experienced, let's say, some uh, budget problems. And in addition, my personal life was getting a bit complicated. And with my daughter on my own, I had to find a stable job. So thanks to my experience with drones, biosensing, and AI, I joined a big French company, uh, but it was kind of in start mode uh, in Canada. And I got closer to the Montreal AI ecosystem. I met amazing people and especially Miriam Cote. Uh, she was the executive director of Mila, uh, the Montreal Institute of Learning Algorithm at that time. And uh, now she's amazing. She has a PhD in machine learning with uh, Professor Yoshua Benjo. And um, when my contract with the, the big company ended, uh, guess what? I, I, I joined Mila, I joined her, and um, yeah, that's where my uh, next step uh, started. Um, Mila was in a start mode and it was a very exciting time. Um, two years ago, AI in Montreal was being a huge thing. And at Mila, I met Professor Cellier. He is a PhD in mathematics and an expert in quantum mechanics who wrote a new formulation of quantum mechanics. And it's funny because we are at almost at the same time and we were sitting next to each other and we started chatting about, you know, quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger cat and quantum computing and his approach. And he said, oh, really, you know, um, I know how to build a new computer. 
So we decided to launch Infinity Q almost a year and a half ago. And obviously, until I quit Mila, we had to do uh, the both at the same time. Uh, a former PhD student, uh, Chrissy, joined us, and I'm so proud that she became our CTO because she's an expert in quantum mechanics in AI and also in uh, HPC, in high performance computer. And we had the chance to have Rachel. Uh, she was also with us, Mila, and she was a PhD in chemistry, and she joined the team last summer to lead the quantum application. And also we have Erika that will join us as a FP, um, FPGA expert. So you can see at InfinityQ the main positions offered by women. So to finish my story, uh, I would like to um, give you some lessons that I learned during my journey. Uh, first, um, it may take time to understand who you are, but you will find it and you have to accept it. I remember I did this uh, interview when I was looking for a stable job at, at Morgan Stanley and the guy said, already you have a great resume, but you know, big companies are really not your thing. And I think it's hard to hear, but you need to know what, who you are. Another um, thing that I learned is professional, personal choices are quite complicated, especially when you, when you are women, because I remember it was hard for me to stay at home when my friends were going on board the aircraft carrier, but at the same time, it was great to spend the birthday of my daughter uh, with her on, on, on the beach when she was two. So it, it, there is no real bad or good choice. It's really important to induce yourself when you make a choice. And another thing is the importance of your family and the support. My husband is amazing and he's always here for me. He supports me 100%. And to end my, my pitch, I, I would say that society puts a lot of pressure on women. And even if we are in 2020, I think we need to continue promoting women in science. It's not a men-only club. Thank you.